game developers will often talk about compulsion loops. How do I keep the player playing? How do I keep them coming back? How do I keep them paying? Last year, the world spent more than $100 billion on video games. That's more than twice what we spent going to the movies. It's just continue to shoot up. This is going to be the century of games. Which means the Game Developers Conference in San Francisco is one place you come to get a glimpse of the future of entertainment. But the leading edge of that future is not where you'd necessarily think to look. It's inside this tiny, indiscriminate booth run by a scientist named Africa Periañez. What she's working on isn't goggles or guns or even a particular game. It's data. We record every single click, every single interaction that uh, players do into, into the game. You can study motivations, how humans react to challenges, to strategies. Africa used to do mathematical modeling and string theory physics at CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research. But now she's betting her future on applying mathematical models to tailor video games to individual players. Maybe the game has seen you play for a while and has realized that this is the kind of things that you seem to want. Maybe you really like driving. Maybe you're not good at all the shooting. Maybe there are things in there that the game, by analyzing your behavior, knows that you would like, but you don't know you like, and then it creates something like that for you. Oh. <laughs> Over the decades, the rise of video games has drawn plenty of criticism. Much of it has focused on how violence in the games affects us long term. Our children are growing up in a culture of carnage. People get an emotional reaction to something and they just assume it has to be bad. You cannot tell me that a kid sitting in a basement for hours playing Call of Duty and killing people right. over and over and over again does not desensitize that child to the real life effects of violence. We actually just published a study looking at kids and their exposure to shooter games. Seven years later, we were not able to find any evidence of a predictive link between playing shooter games at one time period and these kind of behavioral problems that people worry about um, at a later time point. So we're just not finding this kind of predictive evidence oh, damn it. Oh, that early game playing is associated with later problems in kids. Critics have paid way less attention to the more immediate influence games have, as in how they affect our behavior right when we're playing them. And that might be the more important question right now, because we're spending more time than we ever have playing games, and they're with us all the time. Smartphones have changed where, how, and how often people play games, and they've changed who's playing them. The classic view of a typical gamer is, you know, a 15, 20 year old guy in a basement <laughs> somewhere and with a controller in his hand in front of a TV. And, and that's just not the case anymore. Today, the typical gamer is more likely to resemble that boy in the basement's mom. The largest demographic of gamers in the U.S. right now is adult women. That group is a bunch of people who don't, don't see themselves as gamers, right? They see themselves as playing Bejeweled. You can download and start playing Bejeweled in most casual phone games right now for free. Many of them make money through microtransactions, selling you things in the game. Want to upgrade your character's looks or abilities, get an extra life or unlock new features? Pay a buck or two and you're in business. And so is the game. The biggest game on the planet, Fortnite, is free to play. And it's on track to make $2 billion in 2018. And so instead of paying for everything up front, you're paying these little streams of a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars to the game company. And it turns out the companies make tons more money in that model than they ever did back in the day. And the money pouring into a lot of games isn't coming from casual players. It comes from a very small group of big spenders, known in the industry by a special name, whales. A whale is a player that uh, spends a lot and plays a lot. They really love this game, and they love being powerful and special. And the, the big spenders will drop two to $3,000 a month on a single video game. 
whales make up just a tiny fraction of total players, but they can generate more than half of a game's total revenue. Which means finding and nurturing potential whales is the name of the game. How do some companies do that? They turn to people like Africa. We have to ultimate goals, predict every single action that a player is going to take. If he's happy or not, we know that and uh, try to, to make them happy. Africa runs Yokozuna Data, based in Tokyo. They work with several game companies to comb through their data and better understand who's playing. To keep with our sea life metaphor, you can call non-paying players krill, and occasional spenders dolphins. In this new ecosystem, games are built from day one to move players up the food chain. We identify who has potential to become paying users, and also those paying users that has a strong potential to become whale. For VIP players, we can increase I mean, their revenue up to 20%. With Google and Facebook, you know you're being watched. When you're playing a game, you think yourself as not being watched. You think yourself playing in your private universe. But actually, we hand over so much information about ourselves. Every decision you make in a game can be tracked. If you turn right instead of left, jump instead of duck, crush a blue candy instead of a green one, these are all tiny decisions that, when added together, can say a lot about you. You can predict elements of your personality from how you play many games. You can predict age, you can predict gender. You can probably predict a lot of more sensitive things. Um, but hey, <laughs> yeah, I haven't done that follow-up research and I'm not sure I want to do it, but I'm sure someone is doing it. We can leverage human psychology to increase the probability of someone purchasing something. Now, this is true of any product. This is why we have advertising on TV. The, the thing is here that we're operating a little bit closer to the human brain, if you will. That is something I think we do need to be careful with. There is a degree of ethical conduct required of game developers. This worry has way less to do with hazy links between on-screen violence and violence in real life, and way more to do with addiction and compulsive spending. That analogy about whales and what they spend sounds like it was borrowed from a casino. Maybe that's not an accident. Maybe video games aren't just the future of entertainment. They're the future of gambling, too. So it becomes kind of like a slot machine. And the way that slot machines tend to hook users is they give you little reinforcements every so often, but with a promise of a big payout. Please, please. Maybe the most distilled example of this comes wrapped up in a box. Please, just don't screw me up. Give me something. The loot box. Anything. And now I get to pay too much money to open loot boxes. These are boxes that you purchase with in-game currency or real dollars without knowing what's inside. It's easy to see how this starts to look like a gambling problem. Oh, come on. Come on, give me something. Give me at least one of the new ones. No, 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 no. From just saying, hey, look, I'll give you this item if you pay five bucks. You know, that's a fairly straightforward transaction. And that's probably okay. If you say, pay one dollar and we'll see what you get, that is a bit more manipulative. And for some players, they may find that it's difficult for them to disengage from that process because they're always thinking the next dollar, next five dollars, whatever it may be, will be the one that will get me what I want. That's kind of all I wanted to spend. No, you know what, let's, let's do a little bit more. 1,200 units worth. This is it, last time, last time. Depending on the game, it takes on a different shape or name, but the idea is the same. You pay, you open, and you either win... Ah! Oh my God! Or more likely, you don't. F this game. Are you f***ing kidding me? The ability to sort of suck money out of people with these kinds of methods has become so advanced that in some countries like Japan, they have explicitly banned certain kinds of game design because it's just really unfair to the users. It just, it just hauls money out of them. Japan, South Korea, and China have all taken steps to regulate or ban games with loot boxes they deem deceptive. This spring, Belgium banned any game containing a loot box, a decision that could ripple through Europe and possibly the world. Apple also just recently started requiring games with loot boxes to disclose their odds. At a minimum, anybody consuming any product should understand fully what it is and how it works. So games should be completely transparent about what's the revenue model. Unlike slot machines, these games don't currently have age restrictions, and some of them are marketed to kids. And unlike slot machines, 
the next generation of games may be studying you, learning what it takes to keep you playing or what it takes to keep you spending. What will game companies be allowed to do with information they can gather about you and things they can extract from this information? This is going to be a real issue. I don't think there's a bright line between what's not ethical and what's ethical or what's manipulative and what's not. With any new technology, there's always complaints and worries. And this goes back to Socrates, who was worried that students were writing things in books and would no longer remember. And those on the industry's cutting edge say that games becoming more sophisticated, immersive, and personalized is one of the key reasons they're becoming something more profound. More immersive games that actually give us better, deeper, more profound, more significant experiences are fantastic. It's a bit like asking, why should we have better literature? Why should we have better writers? Video games is another world. You move to another world, live another life, and suddenly you become not only another person, you become another entity.